Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February Seekers session. I hope you're having a great weekend. And let's say hi to Jay Copley. How are you, Jay? Hello, Mark. It's great to be here. Good to see you. Welcome. So uh, this month, folks, we're going to be looking at ways that we bury our own creative potential and the unacknowledged gifts in the rejected off-limits part of our psyches known as the golden shadow. Carl Jung, who popularized the concept of the shadow, makes it perfectly clear that until we do what's known as shadow work, which is the process of exploring and working with the hidden parts of who we are, we're likely to remain fragmented and estranged from the totality of our own potential. As Jung put it famously, quote, we do not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious, unquote. The human soul strives for wholeness, he tells us. Integrating our shadow parts is an essential step toward self-realization. Now, of course, shadow work can be very uncomfortable, as many of us know, because it forces us to acknowledge aspects of ourselves that we've done everything we could to hide. But most healing processes involve some form of discomfort, including the adventure of awakening. In splitting off and attempting to forget the unsettling, quote, bad parts of ourselves, a process that starts when we're very young, we also inadvertently push away the good that comes from them. Now, this process is paradoxical, of course, like so much of our lives as homo duplex, the two-sided ape. Wounds and gifts, weaknesses and strengths, pros and cons, pluses and minuses are inextricably connected in us, and we can't deny one half of the equation without also sacrificing the other. As Jung puts it, quote, the truth of the matter is that the shadow itself is 90% pure gold, unquote. So just think about that. The scary, obnoxious, embarrassing, shame-inducing dimension of who you are also contains many of your greatest treasures. The question is, how do we go about retrieving this treasure? The answer is that we have to penetrate our darkness with the light of attention, curiosity, and forgiveness. Only by examining aspects of ourselves that we've held in contempt uh, can we hope to illuminate them with self-love? Ralph Waldo Emerson put it this way, quote, there is no object so foul that intense light will not make it beautiful, unquote. Examining our dark parts with tenderness, understanding, and acceptance, we practice touching into what is beautiful and strong and promising and reshaping, reframing the contents of the shadow to reveal the potential for creativity and growth. So how do we come to deny our own treasure? That's an important place for us to start. You know, perhaps we've grown up feeling silenced, suppressed, or neglected. As children, we learn to protect ourselves against disappointment by being quiet, obedient, or not standing out too much, not rocking the boat or being outspoken. Having adapted to the fear of rejection in this way, we become experts in self-censorship and burying our own aliveness, strangeness, and need for self-expression. Shame is the emotion that we commonly use to push down what's alive in us. Over time, this shame comes to blanket the gold and prevents us from appreciating our latent powers the luminous aspects of who we are, which become cloaked in the psychological shadow. When you examine your shame with scrupulous attention, however, and learn to challenge the prison guard in your psyche, that voice that says, no, you can't, just stifle it, who do you think you are? You gradually dispel the shame of self-judgment to reveal the aliveness that's underneath. But of course, as everyone with an ego knows, shame is a worthy adversary. You know, shame speaks to us in a chorus of ugly voices that are all aimed at killing what's alive in us and convincing us of how worthless we are, how, how little we deserve to be happy. The challenge is to practice responding to these voices with tenderness as well as a measure of strictness 
or even sternness. We want to be gentle with our pain and the wounding that it represents while not indulging our negative voices or allowing them to stop us. We need to realize, in other words, that we are stronger than our shame and that destructive emotions can only defeat us with our own permission. This idea is central to uh, Stoicism, for example, and it's a very helpful one, even though it's not easy to achieve by any means. In the words of Marcus Aurelius, the great Stoic teacher, the Roman emperor, quote, choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel harmed and you haven't been, unquote. Now, that sounds terrific, but it's difficult. It's difficult to choose not to be harmed. It's difficult to choose not to be oppressed by our own shame. But we have to start somewhere. When we embark on shadow work, it's also helpful to remember that this is an archetypal process that's universal for nearly everyone. The journey of retrieving our treasure by going through adversity, the rite of passage that requires a person to face her demons in order to reclaim her gifts, is unavoidable and necessary as we know from spiritual teachings and myths. Just think of Jason and the Golden Fleece. You know, only by setting off with the Argonauts for the unknown across unfriendly waters and confronting the dragon that guards the treasure could Jason lay claim to his prize. Or think of the treasures of Belshazzar in the Bible, who could only possess the gold by going underground into the darkness in order to bring the golden objects to the feast. Understanding that this process of reclamation is universal, that it's a necessary initiation on the path of healing, reverses the belief that there's something wrong with us for being fragmented and imperfect and partial, and it connects us to the larger human story. Rather than seeing shame as some kind of fearsome dragon, you know, on closer examination, it becomes a doorway to our own healing. Just take the example of Sophie Strand, who is our guest interview in this month's Secrets Forum. Sophie was born with a chronic connective tissue disease called EDS that incapacitates her for weeks at a time. This disease has affected both her body and her mind, and it's made her life an ongoing struggle, not only to endure the physical discomfort, which is extreme, but also in tolerating the shame of being disabled, incapable of caring for herself, and struggling in a body that frequently fails her. Instead of being defeated by her illness, however, Sophie has found a way to use her disease as a doorway to wholeness by turning her condition into a spiritual practice, one of connecting to the larger systems of nature. Rather than view her body as an enemy, she practices seeing it as an ecosystem that simply goes out of balance. As she puts it, collapse can be the most generative experience, unquote, because it forces recognition that we're not in control, that her ecosystem, for example, her painful body is part of a larger system that operates on its own principles. This enlarged spiritual perspective has helped Sophie Strand to use her disability as an ally of her imagination, to nourish her work, and to create a holistic, mythological, and ecological vision that's made her into one of the leading lights of her generation as an artist and as an activist. As Sophie puts it, quote, I can take all the right medicines, take care of myself, and it will still collapse. Contracting around that inability to control myself limits my improvisational ability to dance with uncertainty. Isn't that great? Let me just read that again. I can take all the right medicines, take care of myself, and it will still collapse. Contracting around that inability to control myself limits my improvisational ability to dance with uncertainty. And that principle holds true for all of us. When we contract around our inability to control what we don't like, including those parts of ourselves that we wish weren't there, we limit our improvisational ability to dance with the uncertainties of our own lives. When instead we surrender to what is, as Sophie's done, 
we come to see that shame is, in fact, a form of control. It's a negative controlling emotion that helps us protect ourselves from other people's judgments. Because when we feel shame, the focus is always on ourselves with respect to a perceived audience whose judgment we fear. Now, there are healthy forms of shame, of course, you know, when we behave in ways that are morally wrong or hurtful toward others. But unhealthy shame causes us to isolate from our surroundings and withdraw into closed-off self-absorption. Then we not only feel alienated from others, but also from the healthy parts of ourselves. And this is an important point. We can't disown our own demons without also losing our daemon, the Greek term for our genius and the source of our inspiration. We can't deny our imperfection without also sacrificing uniqueness, freedom of expression, courage, worthiness. As Rainer Maria Rilke put it when someone suggested that he needed psychotherapy, don't take my devils away because my angels may flee too. Don't take my devils away because my angels may flee too. Now, this is nothing against therapy, of course. And Rilke was an extreme example. We don't all want to be as tortured as he was. But the point is well taken. The question that we are exploring together this month is, how can we see through our unhealthy shame and illuminate the golden shadow? And I'd like to suggest three possible strategies for doing this. The first one is to notice your own envy. Notice your envy. Envy is a peculiar emotion. The writer Joseph Epstein Uh, in his own book on envy, says that central to the emotion of envy is its clandestinity and surreptitiousness. So we feel shame about our envy, and then we reflexively hide it. And most of us know what this experience feels like. We become ashamed of the things that hurt us, that cause us pain. In that way, shame and envy come to feed on themselves. So ask yourself, When have you felt envious of others? And what does this envy tell you about truths that you suppress in yourself? Unexpressed feelings, appetites, suppressed gifts. When you examine your envy, you may not be able to relieve external circumstances, but you can alleviate the suffering of shame over your envy at not having what others do and you may not. Investigating envy forces the question, if I can't have what I want, say perfect health or endless amounts of money, how can I use this envy and the yearning underneath it to optimize what I do have at my disposal? Instead of allowing envy to consume and diminish you, you can use it to illuminate the golden shadow. You can turn around the tendency to be diminished by envy and by fixated desire by questioning its genesis and stepping back from its viciousness. The writer Dorothy Sayers describes this viciousness very well. She writes, quote, At its best, envy is a climber and a snob. At its worst, it is a destroyer. Rather than have anyone happier than itself, it will see us all miserable together, unquote. And isn't that the truth? That's the reason behind schadenfreude, you know, that delight at other people's misfortune. So begin noticing when envy comes up in you and then ask it to reveal what it's hiding. You know, for example, if you envy a friend his excellent health, ask yourself, what can you do to improve the state of your own body and mind? What can you do? If you envy someone her wealth, ask yourself, what steps can you take toward becoming prosperous emotionally and spiritually as well as materially? This questioning opens new possibilities rather than simply taking the no of shame and envy for the final answer. The second strategy for dispelling shame and revealing the golden shadow is to flip the script on your own faults. So start by asking, what do you see as your worst characteristics? Make a list. Once you've done that, turn the question around and inquire into what these characteristics may be concealing. You know, what's their ulterior secret face, the illuminated perspective behind what you find detestable? For example, let's suppose that you're a borderline hoarder. You may not be living like a shut-in with 10 cats and junk piles from floor to ceiling, 
But you have a real difficulty throwing things away, maintaining order, letting go, and so on. What might your hoarding reflex be saying about what's best in you? Perhaps you're a collector, but you don't have a focus. Or you value holding on to memorabilia because it connects you to the past and the tender impermanence of things and how they feed your soul. You might ask yourself, how can you channel this soulfulness into a form that feeds instead of limiting you? How can you curate your own tendency to cling this impulse to to hold on to things into something that's meaningful and that frees you from living like a prisoner of your hoarding or wasting space on meaningless stuff. Flipping the script on our faults is akin to what Stoics call turning the obstacle upside down. We've talked about this before in the Seekers Forum. Turning the obstacle upside down means acknowledging that every challenge, no matter how daunting, also contains its own solution. The solution might not be what you wanted, but you do come to see that it is nonetheless beneficial, educational, and that there are means toward personal growth when we look past the adversity itself. So ask yourself, how can you flip the script on your own faults? What can you redeem or discover hidden in your gnarliest parts, those things that you most would like not to be there? What's your attachment to an identity that's defined by those faults? And who would you be without the faults that you've taken to be a permanent part of who you are? These are very important questions that we're going to be going into more deeply this month. And finally, the third strategy for illuminating the golden shadow is to allow ourselves to grieve. Allow ourselves to grieve on a regular basis. Now, that may sound counterintuitive in a talk about the golden shadow and our creative potential. But grief, like shame, often comes to shroud our gifts. The weight of accumulated loss, disappointment, sadness, bitterness, anger, incompleteness, and outrage that come with being a human being form an armor around the heart that prevents the light from coming through. The practice of conscious grieving, of grieving in natural, organic, ongoing ways, the way a bird molts or a snake slips out of its skin, reveals the freshness and the vitality that's underneath the armor. It reveals the ever-renewing beginner inside you, the golden child that remains inspired and filled with the delight, regardless of the slings and arrows of a fortune. But to touch into this childlike power, it is necessary to grieve our losses. Otherwise, our treasures stay dormant underneath this cover of emotional suppression. So again, ask yourself, in what ways do you suppress your own sadness? How do you cope with daily wounds and traumas? Might you integrate grief into how you live, not as a joy killer, but as an outlet for loss that lightens your load and keeps the pain from accumulating? Stephen Levine, the wonderful late Buddhist teacher and expert in death and dying, uh, used to talk about the need for temples for grieving, that we need in our culture temples for grieving, a place where we go and are for the express purpose of unloading and releasing our suppressed emotions in order for our aliveness to flourish. Because accumulated pain only makes the shadow more impenetrable. So these three strategies for retrieving our gifts and opening the golden shadow, learning from envy, flipping the script on your faults, and learning to grieve as part of your organic healing can help you touch into your suppressed creativity as well as drop old habits of hiding and fearing. So that's what I wanted to say to you this month about the golden shadow for starters. And now, Jay, why don't we pull up the card and we'll do a bit of writing. Here we go, folks. We're going to take 20 minutes to write about what or whom you envy and what this envy tells you about who you are, what you want, where you're hiding, what you're hiding, and where you're wounded. I want you to be as specific as possible, please. We'll take 20 minutes to do this writing. 10 minutes in, you're welcome to join a breakout room if you would like to connect with other members. Otherwise, just keep on writing. 20 minutes. 